theyeshiva.net. Today, we are not going to uh, explore a Parsha, a Sedra, an Aliyah, a story, a Halacha, not even one Pasuk, not even a uh, part of a Pasuk, not even a word of a Pasuk, and not even a letter of a Pasuk. Rather, we're going to explore a uh, musical note on one word. So we're not discussing the word, the sentence, the verse, the parsha, the musical note. Everybody knows that when we read the Torah, Kriya Satorah is always done with trop, what's called Taimei HaMikra, with a musical melody that accompanies every single word that is read, which is what makes it challenging to be a Balkaira because you don't have the musical notes in the Sefer Torah and it all has to be memorized. The relationship between the music, the note, and each word, few people understand. There are general rules according to the laws of diktuk, of Hebrew grammar, of Lashon Kodesh Dika grammar, which notes suit different words and which parts of the verses, but they bring in the name of the Vilna Gaon a fascinating insight. The Vilna Gaon said that even if we wouldn't have the text of the Torah, all we would have are the musical notes. Theoretically, you would be able to reconstruct the entire text from the music. In other words, if all we had was this. Whatever it may be, from those notes, if you would understand the full depth of each note, of each trop, you can reconstruct the text. One such note is extremely rare in the Torah. It's found seven times in the whole of Tanakh, and four times in the whole of Chumash, Chumash Chumash Torah. Most notes are extremely common. They're read frequently. But whenever you have a, a note that you use only four times in the whole Chumash, it's quite obvious that it needs special reflection. In the entire Chumash Chumash Torah, no more than four times. Why? This note is called Shalshelis. And the first time it appears is in Parshas Vayera. The second time, Chayesara. The third time, Vayeshev. And the fourth time, Tzav. And that's it. The Shalshelas is a unique note, both in terms of its sound and in terms of its shape. If you'll take a look, the first note on top, the, in the fourth sheet, the first, I don't know if it's a source, but... The first image on top of the page, you see Shalshelas, and you have there this zigzag, uh, lightening image, which the Shalshelas portrays. Which, is, which portrays the Shalshelas. What does the Shalshelas sound like? The Shalshelas goes like this. And then some people even add, da -da 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 What does it represent? What does it mean? If you hear somebody saying a word with this musical note, what is the music of the Shalshalas trying to convey? It was one of the earliest commentators on Chumash, unknown but very ancient, Rabbi Yosef Ibn Kaspo. Rabbi Yosef Ibn Kaspo lived at the end of the 1200s and in the early 1300s. This is the era of the Rishonim. He was born in France and lived much of his life where he passed away in Spain. Ibn Kaspo's Svarim are not known, but he wrote close to 30 Svarim, 30 books. 
each one quite original. And he points out in his commentary on Vayera, Ibn Kaspo, that the Shalshalas is the note that represents uncertainty. A person is somewhat paralyzed. A person is in a state of stagnation, stuck. When, in other words, sometimes you have a situation in life, a human being is being pulled in different directions. It's not easy for me, Adank. It's not easy for me just to progress, to move ahead, because I'm being pulled in various directions. On one hand, I perhaps know that this is not the place for me. I should move on. But it's not easy. I can't move on. There are other forces that are pulling me back. In some situations, I know I should detach from the situation. I should move on. I should depart. I should sever the cords. I should embrace. I should reject whatever it is. But it's not easy. I'm pulled in one way, but I'm also pulled in another way, emotionally, conceptually, uh, spiritually, socially, psychologically, whatever the four, financial, financial considerations. And when a person is in that state, the music of Shalshalas depicts it. To put it differently, there's no word in Hebrew for ambivalence. Everybody knows what ambivalence is? <laughs> There's no word in Hebrew for ambivalence. The closest you'll get is Elio Hanavi in Melachim. Ad Mosai at al How long are you going to sit on the fence? Or as we say in Yiddish, vi langves to tansen av tzvei chasenes. Im lashem, lashem, im labal, labal. Either you're coming to my wedding, or you're going to his wedding. You can't dance ei chasen at tzvei techasenes. Although Baruch Hashem in Jewish communities today, metans nisht of zwei chasenes, amol daf metans of zex chasenes. Sometimes you got to attend six weddings because if not, people could stop talking to you forever. So you jump from one, but whenever you're jumping from one to another, you're nowhere, right? You're busy with the next. It's like most handshakes. You ever see politicians or other prominent people give you a handshake? They're already looking at the next, the next person. Says, you have to decide who you are. How long are you going to sit on the fence? Ambivalence is in a state where I can't decide who I am. I don't know. I'm not sure. Or maybe I'm sure, but there's so many other forces pulling me in different directions. We don't have a word for it in Lashon Kodesh. We have a note for it. <laughs> and that's Shalshalas. Listen to the Shalshalas. Like they used to say when the record, you know, you remember the scratched record. Or today it's the scratched CD. And the note repeats itself again and again because there's a scratch. And remember the record players? And it can't move on to the next, to the next part of the record. Aleyam hashalom zechreinam levracha. That's the shalshalis. Listen to it. Okay, that's good. You're reflecting. Okay, next. No. I can't. Now we don't want to keep the community waiting all day for Kriya Satoida. People are hungry for the Shabbos meal, so we do it only three times. But you know, theoretically, the Shalshalas could go on ad infinitum. Did I say it right this time? It can go on and on and on and on. The person is stuck. Take a look at the picture of the Shalshalas. What's the image? It's a zigzag. What's a zigzag? I'm going in this direction, but then I pull back. I go back, but then I pull back. I go back and I pull back. Back and forth, back and forth. I vacillate. I am ambivalent. I want to go here, but I can't go here because I'm going back here. And I, this continues. And the decision process is extremely difficult for me. This Rabbi Yosef Ibn Kaspo says is the essence of the Shalshalas musical note. It is a brilliant and elegant explanation because when you look at the four times that the Shalshalas is to be found in the whole Chumash. Each of them represents a moment of profound uncertainty, profound ambivalence, profound even anguish. Because sometimes I may know the right thing, but the pain to do the right thing, the pain to go forth with my decision is too difficult. I may know intellectually this is exactly what I have to do. But the emotional burden that that comes with 
causes me to be in a state of stagnation, causes me to question, causes me maybe no, maybe there's a way, maybe I could reconcile, maybe I can go back to that situation. The first time is in our Parsha. But let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Let's first go to Chayesara. Let's go to Vayeshev. Let's go to Tzav. We come back to Vayera. The first Shalshalis is in Vayera. Which words? Perik Yutes Posik Tazayan. You remember the moment. Loit has set up and established his family and his future in the city of Zdoim. He left his uncle Avram and he moved to Zdoim. He builds a family. He becomes a prominent figure in Zdoim. The two guests of Avram Avinu, the two angels, come to Loit and tell him this place is going to be destroyed. At last, take your wife, take your family, and leave, leave, escape. And the Pasuk says, Vayisma Mo. You know what Vayisma Mo means? How they touch it in Cheder? In Papa Cheder, how they touch Vayisma Mo? It's a Chfazamt. MS? Fazamt. See, I remember. By ins litvische russische Sachmen fazamt. Nicht fazamt. In Poppe sagt man fazamt. Ja? Ja, weiß ich. Huh? In Munsi, they're ambivalent. <laughs> the Dylan Maven. By Yismama, he got delayed. He delayed. Or probably a better word, he procrastinated. It's a kikratzt. Vayisma mo. You could look the first word pasuk. Vayachziku anoshim beyado vayadishto vayachtei bnoisav bechemlas adinoya love vayetziu vayinichum uchutz loyer. So the two men grab his hand because he's not moving. He's stuck. Vayisma mo. He's. I can't go. They grab him. They grab his wife. They grab his two daughters who lived in the home because of God's compassion on him because he was not ready to leave. And they schlep him out, they take him out, and they place him outside of the city. Vayismama has a shalshalas. Vayismama. I can't guarantee you that the Balkaida de Shabbos will do it as eloquent as I just did it, because he may not understand what he's doing. But nonetheless, this is the shalshalas. At least the Balkaida's note will have some resemblance, I hope, <laughs> to this. Next is Chayisara, next week. Perik of Dalet Pasikit Beis. This is a little more difficult. Eliezer, the servant of Avram, is dispatched by his master to go find a Shidduch, to go find a soulmate for his son Yitzchak. Avram says, leave the land of Canaan, go to my homeland, go to Choron, which is of course Mesopotamia, northern Iraq, in present day geography, and find somebody from where I come from, from the city of Choron. Eliezer says, what happens if the girl doesn't want to follow me to Israel? Should I bring Yitzchak to her? And Avram says, no, then you are cleansed from your, pl from your pledge, from the oath that you made to me that you're going to do this. And he sends him off. When Eliezer comes to the city of Haran, he's outside of the city and he's waiting by the well. And he prays to Hashem. And he says, Vayoymar, Adinoi, it's a full possum. He says, Hashem, God, my God, the master of Avram, please do chesed with my master Avram. Bring here today. Bring forth the right young woman for, for Yitzchak, from my master's son. And he makes the famous test in his mind that if a girl is going to come and I'm going to ask her, if he's going to come to the well to draw water, Remember then in the era before sinks and before bathtubs and before sources of water in your own home. They still have it in some places. I've seen it. You go to countries that are not that developed and everyone gathers by the wellspring, the natural well in the city or outside of the city from which they draw water for a day, for a night, for a few days and so forth. And if I ask this young woman to give me water and she offers me water with grace and kindness and my people, I know this is the Shidduch. On the word Vayoymar, there is a Shalshalas. And he said, Vayoymar. Next, Vayeshev. Yosef has been kidnapped 
by his brothers, cast into a pit, sold into slavery. He sold as an Egyptian slave to an Egyptian master, Paitifar. He works in his home and he's extremely successful. His master loves him. The problem is his master's wife also loves him and not his work. And she does not stop, as we know, seducing Yosef HaTzadik. Zok de Posik. Perik Lametes, Vayihi Achir Advarim Eilav Atisa Eishas Adoinov Esinel Yosef. The wife of his master lifts up her eyes, gazing at Yosef. Vatoymer, she says, Shich Vimi lay with me. Vayim Mo'ein, and he refuses. You remember how they translated that? Etzich Anzakt, yeah? And he refuses. And he says, Elisha's adoin of his wife's master. My master doesn't even know what's going on in the home. He conferred all responsibility on me. Everything, this is my home. There's only one thing that he didn't give me, and that's his wife. How can I do such evil? I'll be sinning to God to, to betray the ethics of morality, as we learned last week, Vidovak be ishto, Veloy be ishos chaved, is one of the Sheva Mitzvahs b'nei noyach. You're a married woman to Paitifra. How can I do this to God? How can I do this to you? How can I do this to your master? The word Vayimain has a shalshalas. Vayimain. He refused. Shalshalas. The last one is Parshas Tzav. Here, it's quite difficult to understand. Moshe Rabbeinu has been training his brother and his nephews for seven days of how to do the avoid in the Mishkan, known as Shiva Simei HaMiluyim. Every day from Chav Gimel Adar till Rosh Chodesh Nisan, he erects the Mishkan, and he is the one who performs all of the services. Aaron watches, Aaron's children, Nadav, Aviyu, Elazar, and Itamar watch their uncle or brother perform all the services in the seven inaugural days when the Mishkan is about to be established permanently. Finally, on the eighth day, Rish Chodesh Nissen, the Mishkan is established, not as inauguration, but for good, till they move it to the next location, and Aaron takes over, Aaron and his children take over. But for the seven days, Moshe did all of the Karbanas, and basically every day he had to sacrifice a bull and two rams, a par and shnei elim. And finally, in Parshas Tzav, we come to the carbon. It's the last offering on the last day of the seven, during the seven days, the last ram. He already offered a bull, he offered one ram, Vayishchot. Moshe slaughters the second ram. Vayikach Moshe Midomi, he takes the blood, Vayiten al Tnuch Eisen Aaron Ayamonis, he puts it on the, on the curtilage of Aaron's right ear, Val Boyan Yodei Ayamonis, and on his right thumb of his hand, Val Boyan Ragli Ayamonis, and on the thumb of his, uh, on the toe, the thick toe of his right foot. The word Vayishchot, has a shalshalas. And he slaughtered. Vayismama, Vayoymar, Vayimoin, Vayishchot. How do we understand the shalshalas in each? Let's see with Eliezer. Ibn Kaspo himself suggests something, and it's quite obvious. He says Eliezer is asking himself, is this? a sign that is sufficient enough to ascertain if this is the right kala for Yitzchak? Come on. You're going to ask a girl if you can have some water and she'll be kind and she'll give you water and that's it? That's a shidduch? We all know, and some people sitting here know this very well, when you're looking into a shidduch for your child, you call people, you call other people, you call third people, and sometimes people sell you the Brooklyn Bridge together with the Manhattan Bridge, together with the Verrazana and the George Washington. And by the time you discover the truth, it's sometimes sadly pretty late. I don't want to say it's too late, but sometimes it's sadly pretty late in the game. This is about people themselves. This is about people's children, people's friends' children, and so forth. Eliezer is singing a shalshalas here. Vayoymar, he says, Hashem, I really need this to work, but I have to say I'm not sure this can work. How am I going to find out? Not even a conversation with her. Where did she grow up? What's her genetic makeup? What type of issues? I have to speak to her therapist, her psychiatrist, her psychologist, her teachers, her friends. That's what Ibn Kaspi himself says. One can add, there's a halachic question. 
The Gemara asks if Eliezer was even allowed to do this. Lo yisenachashu. We don't believe in omens. You don't live by omens. This happened. The Ram says in Chul and Sadekei that this wasn't an omen. This was a character test. It wasn't he was making like this superstitious simon. If this happens, it's a good shidduch. If this doesn't happen, it's not a good shidduch. That would run contrary to halacha. Lo yisenachashu tamim tiyeh ma'ashem alakach. The Ran says in Chulin, this wasn't an omen. This was a character test. He was trying to figure out and see what type of person this is. Of course one is supposed to do this. But there is a third explanation. And this is brought in Bereshis Rabban, it's brought in Rashi. A much more subtle issue. And it was very psychological and very deep. And that is, Eliezer wanted Yitzchak for his own daughter. In other words, Eliezer was loyal to Avram Avinu. And Avram Avinu wanted Yitzchak to find a woman from his own family in Haran. But Eliezer was a conflicted person. Because he had a daughter and he wanted uh, Yitzchak. And this could be for two reasons. One ideological <laughs> and one financial. Ideological, to be a mechutin of Avram Avinu. You know, you could get into all the seminaries in Muncie. <laughs> Your Eneklach won't have problems. They'll be able to get into all the yeshivas. The Zaydas of Ramavinu. The Elta Zayda not. Avramavinu himself wouldn't be able to get into yeshivas because of his father. But, uh, but once Avram was Avram, it would be, wouldn't be a problem. Okay, that's on one level. But on a deeper level, Eliezer dedicated his life to Avram. Eved Avram Anoichi. And Eliezer was a personality. He was a great man. His deepest desire in life was his daughter could marry a person like Yitzchak, have a father-in-law like Avram, that gene, that soul, that spirit for his daughter, for himself, and for their children on one level. On another level, if you want to be a little more, uh, I don't want to say cynical, but maybe a little more materialistic, Avram Avinu's wealth was extraordinary. And Eliezer knew this. And Avram Avinu himself tells Hashem, V'hinei ben meshek beisi yoyrish oisi. Da mesek Eliezer. Avram Avinu says, I'm dying without a child. Avram says, who's going to inherit everything? Eliezer. Da mesek Eliezer. He's the man who's going to get everything. But now Yitzchak emerged. <laughs> He's not getting anything. Unless we keep it in the family. On any level you want to explain this, and perhaps both are true. You know, there's an element of this and an element of that. But on any level you explain it, it was not simple. And this is what Rashi says clearly. Perich of Dalit Pasik Lamites. I'm sorry, Chayisar of Dalit Hey. Eliezer says, By Yoimire Love Ha Eved. Ulai Lai Saiva Yishal Alechas Achre El Aritz Azai Se Hashiv Hashiv is Bidchal Aritz Ashe Yitzhasim Misha. The Eved says, What if the woman doesn't want to follow me back to Yitzchak? Should I take out Yitzchak? Ram says, No way. He's staying in Eitzisra. Zakt Rashi, Ulai loy selech ha'isha acharai. Ulai is supposed to be spelled Aleph of Lamed Yud. Here it's spelled Aleph Lamed Yud. Zakt Rashi, a lai ksiv. When Eliezer said Ulai, there was another meaning to Ulai, a lai. What's a lai? Not maybe, but for me. Bas ha'i seloi l'Eliezer v'ay mechazer limtsay ila sh'yoy malay avram lifnay selav l'asiyay bit. He had a daughter and he was waiting for the moment he was waiting for the moment when Avram will tell him, you know what, why don't we try your daughter? He was hoping Yitzchak is getting older and older and older, and at some point Avram is going to say, you know what, let's just go with you. Avram said, trust me, this is not a match. Whether Avram said this, Avram intimated, Eliezer understood this, but it still did not take away his desire. So now he's standing at a well. Imagine this scene. And he says, Please, please allow me to find right here a proper shidduch for Yitzchak. He's praying, he's speaking, he wants it to happen. But on another level, he doesn't want it to happen. He wants his mission to fail. Sometimes you pray for something and you say you want it because you want it, but you really don't want it. That's what happens here. Is this conscious or is this subconscious? When I grew up learning the Rashi, I always thought it was conscious. Eliezer said, listen, I'm doing my job, but I hate it. <laughs> I don't want it. However, 
the Shemesh Shmuel quotes the Kotzke Rebbe, who was a Zayda. Shemesh Shmuel was the son of the Avni Nezer. The Avni Nezer was married to the Kotzke Rebbe's daughter. He quotes his grandfather, who said as follows, something very insightful. I don't want to move on to this because it's a whole different subject, but he said as follows. This a lie that Rashi speaks about should have been said the first time the story happens. When Avram tells Eliezer, go bring a girl for Yitzchak, Eliezer says, what if she doesn't want to come? That's where it should have been a lie without a vav, because Eliezer was saying, you know, me. It's not there, it's in the second time. When Eliezer repeats the story, when he repeats the story to the mechotonim, to Rivka's parents and brother, that's when he says, I told Avraham Ulai, and that's where it says a lie. One second. He's telling this to the Mechatanim? <laughs> He's telling them, by the way, I'm not interested in the Shidduch. <laughs> He's telling so by the way, I want, I want, I want Yitzchak, say no. Then he's mamish undermining everything. So why in the second time around? The Kotzke Rebbe says that it was all subconscious. Now this is a hundred years before Freud. Appreciate it. A hundred years before Freud. He said, a little less even, he said that it was subconscious. Eliezer wasn't aware. He was undermining his prayers, but he wasn't aware that he was undermining his prayers. You know when he became aware of it? He revisited the story in his own heart. When you tell over the story and suddenly, wow, I was stuck, I was stuck. Sometimes you do things, you say things, you operate on a level, you don't realize what's happening. It's instinctive, it's subconscious. When you have the courage to revisit the story and to confront it, you identify it, then you realize what happened. And he argues, brilliantly I would say, that the reason that this story is repeated in Chumash a second time, it's a parsha that's one of the longest parshas in Chumash, for no reason. The pastor could have said Eliezer came to Psuel and he told them the whole story. And he said, now give me Rivka. That's it. And you saved yourself, not two psukim, you saved yourself dozens and dozens and dozens of psukim. This is probably the longest parsha in Chumash, if I'm not mistaken. 69 or 70 psukim. Close to 70 psukim. 70 psukim. For that the Shabbos has 39 malachas. <laughs> we don't even have one pasuk for. <laughs> not one pasuk that Shabbos has 39 malachas. We learn that from Eile, Ha'ele, Mishkan, Maisus. That's Shabbos every week. But Eliezer, the whole parsha, twice. The Kotzke Rebbe says, because when you undermine something subconsciously, it's not going to happen. And how do you have to deal with it? You have to bring it to the fore. And once you can identify that you have ulterior motives, you can quarantine them, and then you can move on. You're a free person. To be free, you don't have to be cleansed from your demons. You just have to identify your demons. To be a free person, you don't have to cleanse yourself from all your issues. But you have to be able to identify them. You have to be able to say, I really don't want this to happen. <laughs> I want every girl to say no to Yitzchak. I hope this is a miserable failure. And then I'll come back and I'll cry. Nebuch, it didn't happen. I'll say, Baruch Hashem, thank God. As long as you can identify the conflicts in your own heart, then you're free to make a decision. You're free. That's why it has to repeat himself, because only when Eliezer became aware of the subconscious obstacle did he let it go, and then it happened. Interesting interpretation. I mean, he says this in three and a half lines. I'm elaborating a little bit, the way I understand it. So Eliezer is stuck. When he says, Vayoymar, He's like, Hashem, please. But you know what? It's There's no complete uh, flow. It's interesting. The word that he uses is ulai. <laughs> ulai means maybe. But it's not a common term that's always used. There's other words for maybe, right? How do you, when you want to say maybe, what do the Israelis say when you want to say maybe? Echam and maybe. Ulai ma'od. Huh? Okay. Or? <laughs> or Shema, right? Here it's Ulai. What's the difference between Ulai and Shema? In Lashon Kodesh, everything is precise. What's the difference? 
So the Eben Ezra says in Tehillim, Kuf Tazayin, Vekacha milas ulai, palm shema, upam kemoy mesava. Sometimes ulai is like halavai, I wish. Sometimes, no, 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 I don't wish, but maybe. Ulai uchalihi lochem, right, that's bollock. I wish I could combat. Ulai, I wish. Maybe, but I really wish. I know it's not, it's not so simple. Ulai yiyeze. Upam shema. Ulai loy seva ha'isha. This is not a halavai. Pam ulai loy seva isha. What is Devin Ezra saying? There's different types of ulais. There's an ulai which is halavai, and there's an ulai that's a maybe. Now this ulai at the surface is maybe. But beneath the surface it's halavai. You know when you invited somebody for Shabbos and like you, you realize it was a mistake or whatever? You're not ready. Your wife is not ready. So you like call them and you, like you call them Thursday night and you say, maybe it's better for you to come another Shabbos, right? It's not maybe. It's like, I wish. I wish. <laughs> I'm not going to say I wish you don't come. They say, maybe it's better to come another Shabbos. Maybe, maybe. Which usually gets into more problems. They say, no, we're looking forward. We're bringing even a few more guests. And it becomes even more wonderful. The answer for that is not to be a perfectionist. And to remember that if you have personality, they don't come for your food, you they come for the company. And if you don't have personality, you shouldn't be inviting guests for the first time. I'm just joking. But okay. So Ulai means, Ulai could mean maybe, Ulai could mean Halavai. Granted, Eliezer prays for a Kala, for Yitzchak, but it's not so simple. Next, Yosef. With Yosef, he refuses, but the refusal comes with tremendous anguish, tremendous sacrifice, tre tremendous agony. Why? It's not hard to understand. Even if we wouldn't know who Yosef is in terms of righteousness and holiness, if you just read the story on a surface level, here is a boy who was 17 years old, grew up without a mother. His brothers despised him and hated him. He had one friend who loved him, who believed in him, his father, nobody else. His brothers, not the mafia, his brothers kidnap him, want to kill him, throw him into a pit, remove that lovely tunic, and then sell him into slavery. Now this is before Lincoln's days. Slave meant a slave for life. It wasn't 12 years a slave, it was a slave for life. And a slave in Egypt. You're not dealing here with an era of, uh, of democracy and emancipation and so forth. So this prince, a grandson of Yitzchak, a great grandson of Avraham, lost his entire freedom. And Mazel, or God's grace, his master loves him. Not only does he not bother him, not only does he not torture him, not only does he not abuse him as slaves were, especially in the South here in America in the dark days of slavery, but his master says, this house is yours, you're the best. You take over everything and I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm away. You, 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 he delegates everything. And Yosef finally found what you would call some life, some dignity, some future. Now understand the tragedy of this person. On the track. And now something happens. His master's wife wants him. And all she wants is five minutes. And she threatens him. Take a look at the Gemara in Yuma Lamed Hay. She goes with good and she goes with bad. Every day, this wasn't once a week, every day he was getting WhatsApps and texts and messages and some other things. She spoke and spoke and didn't stop. Her husband wasn't home. He was one of these guys. He's never home. You know what I mean? So the coast was clear. He was on business trips. He was making money. He was running the empire. The coast was clear. Yosef was running the house and she was there. You can understand. Now, now the Gemara starts talking about the credit card bill that Petifer had to pay. B'godim shalof shaloy shachrus leilof shaloy arvis. The clothes she put on in the morning, she didn't put on in the evening. The wardrobe changed for breakfast, for lunch, and for supper. The rest of the day she had to shop. 
You can't have so many outfits. Understand? This woman was ups- obsessed with Yosef. She was strategizing. She was planning. It wasn't a one time upsataiva somebody has. Amra Loi, she tells him, Hashmali, listen to me. Just listen to me. Amar Lolav, he says, no. Amra Loi, Adeni Chayvashtach Bebeisa Asurin, I will incarcerate you for life. She does it. <laughs> he says, no. Hashem Matan Asurin, Adeni Chayfefes Chaymosach. Yosef was a tall, handsome figure. I will crush your height. I will destroy you. I will crush you. She doesn't only mean physically. Number one, physically. And number two, emotionally. When I'm done with you, you will be the loser of the century. He says, I don't care. Yosef had beautiful eyes. He was, I will blind you. I will blind you. Yosef refuses. So she says, you know what? What do I have to go with negative? Let's go with the positive. She gives him a thousand kikri kesef. In today's world, I would say, she gave him five, six million dollars for five minutes. For five minutes, a 17-year-old boy before Matan Torah. Now let's understand this. This is pikuach nefesh l'chol days. A shidduch, it's not going to damage in the family. The family reputation... Won't be ruined. In Egypt, this is what people did. Shtufei Zimmer. Last week we spoke about the great uh, saintliness of, of the more of the, of the Shtufei Zimmer in Egypt, but at the end of the day they were Shtufei Zimmer. They were promiscuous people. Ervas Haaretz. This was the common way. This wasn't the unique thing. And it's not that Yosef was living near his family, so the next day there would be signs all over Meisharim telling the world who Yosef is. And it would affect the shidduch of his brothers and the shidduch of his sisters and the family reputation of the yeshivas that they get into and the communities that welcome them. None of this would happen. Nor did he have a father, nor did he have, nor did he have a mother, nor did he have a father's father thought he was dead. On the word Vayimoy, there's a shalshalas. And this, of course, we hear an echo of it in the famous Gemara Masech to Saitu. Saitu Lamed Veiz. Tana Debeir Rabbi it says it was one day. There was nobody home. There was nobody home, and the only one who came home was Yosef And she finally grabs him and she says, "Please be with me." It was the holiday. Everybody went to the ashram. Everybody went to the temple. Everybody went to the. What did they call it there? I don't know. The monastery, whatever it was. They went. This was obligations. <laughs> right? Lahavdil Yom Kippur. Nobody's home. Everybody goes to shul. Lahavdil. This was the time everybody left. She told everybody, I'm sick. She wasn't sick. She feigned sickness and she was home. Today, the world is safe. The house is safe. This is a day that Yosef will finally surrender. Nobody could catch him. Nobody's here. Nobody's coming home. This is the day. She grabs him by his clothes and asks him to lay with him. And we all know what happens at the end is he flees and he leaves the cloak in her hands. So the Gemara brings over there that Rav and Shmuel and one opinion is Yosef actually surrendered. At that moment, what a dramatic Gemara. The image of his father comes and appears in the window. He says, Yosef, my son, the names of all your brothers will be written on the stones of the ephod, of the Kohen Gadol's apron. All the names of the Shvatim were engraved on the gems of the ephod and the choshen v'ata b'neim ritzoyncha sh'yimacha shimcha m'beneim v'tikare roya zaynas Are you ready really to delete your name forever from that list and be called a shepherd of harlots? Yosef abstains at the last moment but the shalshalas of ayimoyen tells us that there was a tremendous struggle There was tremendous pain. There was tremendous anguish. This was not an easy moment for Yosef.
He refused. But how did he refuse? There was a shalshalas. Understand the crisis of conscience that Yosef has. On one side stands the temptation of his moment. On one hand stands the question of pikuach nefesh. Will he end up his entire life in prison as a blind, crushed individual? On one hand stands a person who has no family and no friends. And the step from here can only be doomed to purgatory forever in Egypt if he disobeys. That's one side. And then there's another side. He's a son of Yaakov. He's a grandson of Yitzchak. He's a great-grandson of Avram. The entire moral commitment of the family of Avram Avinu is about to be shattered by Yosef if he engages in this. Or as Yaakov put it here, are you really ready to delete your name from the covenant that God made with Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov to live a higher life? A life dedicated to truth, a life dedicated to morality, a life dedicated to ethics, a life dedicated to genuine values. Are you ready? Does it make sense for you to delete your name for eternity from that list in order to satisfy this moment? Yosef, we of course, decides no. And that's why the Zoyar says he's the only one from those generations who's called the Tzaddik, Yosef HaTzaddik. Not Avram, not Yitzchak, not Yaakov, not Moshe. Nobody has the title Tzaddik. None of his brothers. Only Yosef and the Zoyar says it was because of that moment. Because of that Nisoyan, because of that test. And think also about the loneliness of this child. There's nobody he can call that night and say, I was victorious. He's not going to come to shul and his Rosh Hashiva is not going to give him a hug and say, Ah, Yisrael Asher Becha Aspire. I'm proud of you. Nobody would tell that to him. All they would tell him in prison is, Bistan idiot. Bistan shaita. That's what you are. And she was right. She put him away. And he would have remained in a pit in Cairo. And you know that pits in Cairo are not fun places to be. Not today and not then. The only reason he came out was, more than a decade later, because Pyro is busy having dreams, is busy having nightmares. But Yosef couldn't expect and count on that. There's a shalshalas. And I find this moving because uh, the Torah very subtly is paying tribute to the struggle this boy went through. And that the decision he made was not struggle free. And the Torah says, when you read that Vayimoyen, remember that. Some people say no. And nobody will ever guess what is behind that no. How much blood, how much sweat, how many tears did Yosef pour down on his pillow? How wet was that pillow? Because of what he had to do at that moment. That's the Vayimoyen. It pays tribute to the depth of the conflict. The depth of the struggle that nobody will ever know about because the decision was a clear decision. It was decisive. Only God and the person. That's the Vayimoyen. And then comes the Vayishchot. The Vayishchot in Parshas Tzav. Now that's a difficult one to understand. What was Moshe's ambivalence? And perhaps one could suggest two ideas. Number one, I would say more human. Number one, also human, idealistic, but a deep human feeling. And number two, the question of a real leader and a real pedagogue. The Gemara says in Zvachim Dav Kuf Beis that when Moshe Rabbeinu was summoned by the bush to become the leader, he refused for seven days. Finally, at the end, Vayichar Af Hashem B'Moshe. Hashem gets upset and what does he say? Aaron, your brother, the Levi, is going to come to greet you. You're afraid your older brother is going to be envious of you. Baby Moshe became the prophet. It's not easy for an older brother to watch. Not your brother. Your brother is Aaron. It's easy for an older brother to watch a baby brother be successful. And then when he sees him, he pats him on the back to make sure that he still knows he's his baby. You know that one? You do it so well, I'm proud of you, yeah. <laughs> sure. It's like Eliezer Zulai. <laughs> Hashem should even give you more <laughs> Please, not in my lifetime. 
was once a very cute moment. Avram Fried, who's an Edelayid and a good friend of mine, was doing a concert with Mordechai Ben David. So uh, after Mordechai sings, Avram takes the mic and he says, uh, you know, they say that Mordechai Ben David is the king of Jewish music. And it's true. He's the undisputed king of Jewish music. And, and all of us, including myself, we celebrated why did it have to happen in my lifetime. <laughs> But he was saying it in very good humor and, uh, you know, you wouldn't say this in public if it's uh, genuine. Unless you're a real con artist, then he's not. So, uh, Hashem says, Aaron is not that brother. He's going to celebrate with you. But he calls Aaron a levi. Aaron a chicha levi. So the Gemara says that the charoin af us harayshim, that Moshe was supposed to be the kayan and Aaron the levi, but it ended up that Aaron was the kayan and Moshe was the levi. How is that connected to Moshe not taking the mission for seven days? That's a separate shi'a. Because as you know from these shi'urim, punishments are not punishments of vengeance. Punishments are consequences. They're always consequences. Schar mitzvah is the mitzvah. Schar aveda is the avera itself. It's not separate from the avera. Okay, that's a separate parsh. But now, Moshe, for the last time, is doing the last shita, And the next time... Aaron is going to be taking over. For seven days, Moshe did the job. But at last, he has to give over that mantle, that position of kuhuna gdoyla to his brother. Moshe does it. But when he does that last shchit of the second ram on the seventh day, he will never do it again. There's a shalshelas. There's a deep sense of reflection, of hesitancy, of tragedy, and this is also a profound idea. A leader has to know who he is. Equally important is to know who he's not. A lot of people know who they are. It's much harder to know who you're not, to acknowledge who you're not, and to embrace who you're not. To know what was given to you, and to know what was not given to you, what was given to your brother. <laughs> now that's hard. What was given to your sister, what was given to somebody else. It's only when I own not only what I am, but what I'm not, that I can actually begin to be who I am. Because if you don't know who you're not, you'll never know who you are. Or you will never embrace who you are, and therefore you will never do what you're supposed to be doing. Because in your mind, I'm busy being you. <laughs> do I have to elaborate? For the women, probably not. For the men, as much as I elaborate, it'll take another few decades. But we'll figure it out one day together. <laughs> one, of the great, one of the great signs of great people is they know who they are but they also know who they're not. And it's not always easy to acknowledge who you're not. But as they say, we're all born originals, most of us die as copies. And as somebody else said, don't try to live somebody else's life because that life is taken already. <laughs> so Moshe Rabbeinu at this moment really says, I'm not the Kayan. I'm not the Kayan Gadol, it's my brother, Vayishchat. Okay. Then you have Reb Chaim Kanevsky in a safer time with the Kra. This is already a very different answer. Chaim Kanevsky says that he delayed the shchit like a shalshelis. You know why? Because he needed enough blood to get on the cartilage of iron and the thumb of iron and the, and the, the, the thumb of iron and the, and the toe of iron, the big toe of iron. So shalshelis, the, the shchit was longer to be able to get more blood. And the Rekha Chavin Tzofnas Paneich has his derech that at the last moment he converted it from a shlomim to a chatas, a different parish. Fine. I think there's also one more element, and that is, somebody told me Friday night, a therapist told me Friday night that he sometimes asks elder, older patients or mature patients, he says, uh, when you're 70 or 80 or 90 and you're going to look back at your life, are you going to have any regrets? What might you say could have been different or I should have done differently? Just think about that. So I asked him, what do they usually respond? He says, they usually don't understand the question. Which I guess is in itself a profound response. Because you have to be somewhat, at least, eager to be a little self-aware to ask that question. Moshe, like all great people, continuously asks that question. And uh, at this moment, Moshe asks one question. And that is, I educated my brother and I educated his children. Did I do it right? Did I do it right? You know, when you're bringing your daughter or your son under the chuppah, so there are the emotions of the moment, but there are also deeper emotions because to 20 years 
or 25 years or whatever the number is of raising this child comes into razor sharp focus at this moment. Maybe the moment that the chassan covers the collar, the moment, whatever, certain moments that bring 25 years together in an instant. And there's no time for profound and complicated reflection, but you have that shalshelas. You know, you pause, and that pause is a very deep question of, uh, did I live up to my mission? Did I live up to my potential? That's the vayishchat, the shalshelas of Moshe Rabbeinu's last vayishchat. The next vayishchat will happen 21 psukim later, and it will not be Moshe. It will be Aaron. At last, we come to the fourth shalshelas in Parshas Vayera, the story of light. And in many ways, I would say, here you have one of the profoundest crises of the human heart, of the human consciousness. Loit vayisma mo. He's delayed. Why? Why doesn't he leave? Does he not trust the angels? Is it a question of philosophy, of theology? Maybe they're just uh, they're jokers. They're trying to sell him. They're, they're trying to you know sell him a, a, a Ponzi scheme. Is this a Ponzi scheme? Why vayisma mo? Rashi says balabatish. The man had a lot of money. <laughs> he couldn't take all the money. But yes, mama, you don't leave without the money. And he had to. He didn't doubt them, but the person is connected to money. Right. If that's the case, so we have an interesting concept. The Mishnah says, Hakina might Jealousy of others, cravings, and, uh, and the need for covet. Turn your life into a miserable life. Anybody experience this? You're jealous, you have tivus, addictions, deep cravings, crushes, that you, or, or covet, you need covet. You know, they say, when the Imre Emes, the Geri Rebbe, came to Eretz Yisrael, one of his visits, he went to visit the chief rabbi then of Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Avram Yitzchak HaKoyen Kuk. So he went to Rav Kuk's house. So Rav Kuk gave him the seat at the head table where he usually would sit. So the Imre Emes tells Rav Kook, no way, I'm not taking this seat. I'll sit where the guests sit on the side. So they're arguing back and forth, back and forth. So Rav Kook took out the card. Psachim. The Gemara says, Psachim, where is it? Peivov, I think. Kol ma'sha balabayiz, oy malucha. I say. Whatever the balabayiz tells you to do, you do. I'm the balabayiz. I told you to sit at the head table. You're supposed to sit at the head table. And it's halach and shulchan aruch. <laughs> This is Allah and Shulchan Aruch. You come to somebody's house, whatever the Balabayas tells you to do, you do. <laughs> so the Imre Yemes says, you have to read the end of the Maimah Chazal. The end of the Maimah Chazal is Chutz Mitzay. Chutz Mitzay means whatever the Balabayas tells you to do, do. Besides, if he says, get out of the house, that you don't do. If he says, get out of the house, you say, tough luck, I'm here already, I'm staying for a year. You know, they say there was a mashullah who came to somebody's house. For, he was collecting, so he asked if he could stay here for a little while. He says, sure, how long? He says, a night, two nights. Okay, one night, two nights, a week, two weeks. After four weeks, the guy was a nice guy, but it was a little tough for him. And the mashullah was a quintessential Veltznudnik also. So at one, some point, he's onto the Bimurama, so he says, you know, where do, your wife, where do your wife and children live? He says, they live in a Tisson, your Shalayim. He says, I'm wondering, you don't miss... Uh, you don't miss your wife and children, so the next day they arrived. <laughs> um, I once saw, uh, who says it? The Maharit, somebody, one of the early Acheroinim, a big God will be sold, he says, Kol chutz mitzay. Whatever the Balabayas tells you to do, you have to do, but only if he tells you to do it. If he thinks you should do it, you don't have to do it. Sometimes you see that your host, yeah, has all these calculations, and if you look into their eyes, you see what they want. You don't have to. He doesn't want to tell it to you, his problem. It's his problem. Whatever he tells you to do, you do. Besides one thing, say. When it comes to leave, even if he doesn't tell you, <laughs> it's time to go out. say. <laughs> even if he makes a remes. This doesn't mean if you decide that he told you, or if you decide he thinks you want, that's your own insecurity. But if you talk to see that he really wants you to leave, even though he doesn't say it, you're allowed to pick yourself up and go, okay, right, cute vart. So the Imre Emes tells Rav Kook, Rav Kook said, I didn't ask you to leave the house, I asked you to sit at the head table. So the Imre Emes says, let me tell you, Pshat and Chutz 
Whatever the Balabayas tells you to do, you should do. Besides, if he tells you to do one of the three things, that I might see as Sa'adam in Ha'ilam. He says, you want to give me covered. <laughs> you want to put me at the head table here, so I should get covered. He says, Akina va'ataiva va'kavid might see in Sa'adam in Ha'ilam. Whatever the Balabayas tells you to do, you do. Chutz mitzah, unless he tells you to do one of the three things that tells you, say, get out of the world. Might see in Sa'adam in Ha'ilam. So essentially you have three shalshalasin. The shalshalas of Lloyd, according to Rashi, would be kina. He can't depart from the money. The shalshalas of Yosef would be taiva. The shalshalas of Eliezer would be, he wants Avram as a mechitin, <laughs> covet. That's on one level. But let's take it, let's take it to one more level with, uh, with Lloyd, to a deeper level with Lloyd, what the Vayismama really is. I think what Rashi is saying is, it's not just the money, it's everything the money represented. You see, let's analyze for a moment Lloyd's story. It's a very dramatic story, Lloyd's story. If you think about Lloyd's story, Lloyd was a nephew of Avram Avinu. He lived in the shadow of Avram. He was raised by Avram. His father was burnt. Haram was killed. Avram raised Lloyd. Avram and Sarah took Lloyd under their wings. They supported him. He escorted them. He was Mamesh Ben Bayes. He was a family member. He was his nephew. His closest kin, Avram didn't have children. And Avram did well, and Lloyd did very well. But at some point, Lloyd saw a different life for himself. At some point, Lloyd's eyes perceived that his future, he wants to be very different than Avram's future. At some point, he made a conscious decision. It's time to move on. Avram Avinu said, there's something in this relationship that's not working. You live differently. Your ethics are different. And I'm not going to go far, but wherever you go, you go your place, I'll go my place, so we could remain in peace. Good fences, good neighbors make. What happens? So the Pasuk says in Lech Lecha Yud Gimel, Light lifts up his eyes and he says, Give a cook, give a cook at the Riviera, at the Riviera of Eretz Yisrael. Take a look at the landscapes of Zdoim. Ah, there you could live like a mensch. What do I have to live in a basement in Brooklyn? What do I have to live in this Fahakta place wherever I'm living? I have a future for myself. What do I have to live between these people and these people? What do I have to live in this community? Everybody looks, am I wearing this garment, that garment? Did I dive a mincha at six? Did I dive a mincha at four? Did my kids like this? My kids like that? My wife this? My, what do I need this for? I don't need this place. I can build a future for myself. First of all, I can have a mansion. Second of all, I can have, sounds like Muncie, I can have nine acres. What do I need to live in a garage somewhere in Williamsburg or Borough Park? And besides everything else, have light makes a chesh. Lloyd chooses for himself the entire plain of the Jordan River. He leaves and he separates from Avram. And Anashi says, Mikedem doesn't only mean geographically, it means spiritually. Avram's life is not my life. He's a good uncle, he's a saintly man, it's just not me. So we understand Lloyd's character. Lloyd is a young, ambitious fellow. He learned a lot of good skills growing up in Avram's house. Certainly he takes some things from Avram Avinu. We see he's going to be a nice host. But Light has a different welt on Shaung. He's not committed to Avram's God. He's not committed to a covenant with God. His mission in life is not Vayikra Shom B'Shem Hashem Kel Oilam to reveal that the world is divine. That's not his mission. His mission is ambition, success, prosperity, and tremendous Tremendous inter integration in a different society, mainstream society. I don't need Avram's life. It's restrictive, it's inhibiting, it's not for me. Anybody engage such an option here? Any of your children? Okay. What happens? Light moves on. He moves on. And you know what happens? The man is successful. <laughs> How do I know he's successful? It says in Vayed of Light Yoshev. Bishar's daim, what does Rashi say from Bereshit's Rabbah? Minu shoifet aleyem. Here's a Jewish kid. <laughs> Comes to Zdoim, we know Zdoim, Anshe Zdoim, Royim Vachatoim, Lashem Miyot. Zdoim is capitalism to its extreme. 
Stoim is not just a capitalistic city. If you give tzedakah, they'll kill you. Shali, shali, shaloch, shaloch. At the surface, it's not bad. You make your money, I make my money. I don't give you mine, you don't give me yours. But I make my money, it's mine. And you don't start feeding poor people. We don't have schnarrers in this town. People work hard, they wake up 5 o'clock in the morning, they're sitting at the desk 6.45 a.m. after a gym. 4 o'clock, they made their money, they go home to drink pina colada and lay in the hammock and read a book till they go to sleep. That's how it is. There's no hospitality here, there's no sharing, there's no giving. You are for yourself. That's how you live. This is the society light wants. Exact opposite of Avraham Avinu. Exact opposite. Avraham Avinu is sick after a circumcision and he sees three Bedouin Arabs and he runs. Come, Vishanu Tachaseitz. Come. Abyssal Vasek and I give you some tongue with mustard. Toyamel. Some tongue with mustard that he has to slaughter and bake and milk and sour cream and burger, cheeseburgers, whatever he gave. Ayika Chema Vecholov and Abok Asheros. It wasn't Mama Cheeseburgers, first was milk, then was meat, but he gave them a L'shem Teferis. Light is the opposite extreme. I want to take care of myself, I want to take care of my family. And you know what? He does well. The man becomes a Supreme Court justice in Zdoim. Now when you hit the Supreme Court, you're a shtickle mensch. You're a shtickle mensch, Supreme Court, that's who he is. Not only that, he has two daughters who married out. Right? He has two daughters. Rashi, there's a Pusik. He has two daughters who married out. They intermarry. They have children. He has already his doim in-laws. He has doim ein He's an integrated man. He has two daughters at home who are already married to two men before the Nisuyim, but after the marriage. He's, they're still living at home. In other words, he already has four shidduchim with local members. He's so integrated. He's so accepted. The stereotype. The stigma of being a Jew, of being a Ramamin, removed. Supreme Court. Fir Adams, Fir Adams, that are all capitalistic, successful, I don't know, bankers or whatever they were. But they were extremely successful and prosperous. What else do you want? His wife, Alts good. Everything good. The man is doing well financially, psychologically, socially. Or so he thought. Or so he thought. And then there's a scene. And the scene is two guests come. He invites them because he's fart. <laughs> In his genes, he's, you know, you could, take, you could take the Jew out of Russia. You can't take Russia out of the Jew. Right? You could take Lloyd away from Avram, but you couldn't take everything from Avram out of Lloyd. And he invites them to the house. And when the Sodomites find out that there are guests, they come to Lloyd, they say, Shikzerais. This is unacceptable. We'll do what we have to do. Light begs them. And here we see a warped morality. He says, I'll give you my daughters. But don't touch the guests. They're my guests. And then comes the scene. Vayeru you test test. Vayoimru they say, Gesh hala, move away. Vayoimru and they say. And here is a sentence. As most people, they read Chumash, they gloss over the richness of the words. Here is a sentence that Jews would be hearing for the next 4,000 years. Vayomru, they said, Ha'echad bal lagur, vayishpet shafait. You came here as a stranger. You're a refugee. The bistagir, vayishpet shafait. And you're telling us how to live our life. You're telling us how to judge. Light, remember who you are. Remember who you are, bistashmutzakayid. You're a filthy old fashioned oist you, Yuda. Go back to the east. That's who you are. You're going to come and tell us how to run this city. The city was here before you. It will be after you. Remember forever you're a gear. Here's a Jew who thought he was integrated. All his kids married out. He made it to the Supreme Court of this doim uh, country or city. And now they tell him, all you are is a parasite. You're a parasite. You're an alien. And they continue, Ata. We will harm you much more than we will harm them. So what happens? The angels take Lloyd in and they lock the door. They blind the people by the door. And Who do you have? Do you have a son-in-law? Do you have sons? Do you have daughters? Take them all out. 
כי משחיסים אנחנו את המוקרים, כי גוד לא צעק קוסם את פני השם. The outcry of, of suffering in this place, of people who are unfortunate, is beyond. Vayetzei loit, he believes them. Vayedaber el chasonov loit chibnoisov. He goes out to his sons-in-law, and he goes out to the people who married his daughters. And Rashi wants to know what's the redundancy. And Rashi says it's two sets of men. There is chasonov, his sons-in-law. And then there's loit chibnoisov, another two sons-in-law, who didn't yet move in with their, with their wives, but they're already married. We would call it engagement. Then there was what you called Aris, and they were married, but they weren't living together yet. Two sets of in-laws. Two sets of son-in-laws. Four people. This is a father-in-law who's wealthy, successful, integrated. He got the best shidduchim in Zdoim. The best. And he says, listen, you'll thank me one day. Get out. What's their response? In the eyes of his son-in-law, he looks like a gesture, a joker, a shoite, a fed, a metzachik. You're not even worth arguing with. You're an idiot. You're a fool. That's what you are. You're a fool. Dawn breaks. Take your wife and take your two daughters. No time to wait. The next word, Vayisma Mo. Now, see the Shalshalis and Vayisma Mo. Understand what's happening here to a person. He invested his whole life in a future that he thought would guarantee him happiness and success. He never really liked it by Avram. Psychologically, I can explain to you why. He blamed Avram for his father's death. Because Haran died, remember, Rashi says at the end of Noyach, you don't learn Chumash anymore, huh? Like a forgotten text. Chumash like a forgotten text. Tafyoimi, no Chumash. Rashi says at the end of Parshish Noyach that Haran lived on the fence. And when they threw Avram into the fiery furnace, he said, if Avram wins, I'll go with him. If Avram loses, Haran is that, you know, he's a professional. He looks, you know... Which, which team is going to win? And that's who you go with. <laughs> Avram was saved. So Haran said, I'm one of Avram's men. And he was thrown in and he was killed. Lloyd was the orphan. So you can understand who did Lloyd blame for his evil, for his misfortune. He blamed Avram. But he was tied to Avram. The word Lloyd means curse in Aramaic, right? Lloyd, bracho klala. Klala is levot in Lloyd. Finally, Lloyd invests his whole future. I don't need this anymore. I don't need this education. I don't need this. It's too much. I don't need Rosh Hashanah, Yim Kippur, Tishrei, Shabbos, Yom. It's too much. Leave me alone. There's a big, nice world out there. He never perhaps captured the soul of Avram, but that's our light. And he invests in a new life, and it's emacht gut. <laughs> the world is a good place for him. He finds four beautiful shidduchim. He becomes a Supreme Court justice. He becomes financially, socially integrated. And he believes in the philosophy of Zdaim. He believes in the lifestyle of Zdaim. And he comes once a week for a Thanksgiving dinner to Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu did Thanksgiving three times a day. But he came, I guess, once a year. He probably paid tribute for Psa Shalom Zacha or whatever. He came to say, Uncle, I'm here for you. And that's it. He went back. And suddenly, suddenly, the whole future that you invented for yourself comes crashing down. The whole society looks at you and says... You are forever an outcast. You want guests in your house? Never. We will not trust your decision. We will hurt you much more than him. You'll hurt me? Me? I'm one of you. I know your poetry better than you. I know your theater is better than you. I know your culture better than you. I know your constitution better than you. I made it to the top. They said, you are an alien, you're a gayer. And when he looks at his sons-in-law and he says, come leave, we always knew you're just a moron, we used you. What do you do now? What do you do emotionally? You hear, this, you understand the crisis. On one hand, you know it's time to go. Lloyd is not stupid. He knows these people are not lying. He saw also what they did in the house to the people. He knows it's time to go. But how could he? To say that I have to go means I have to look in the mirror and say, for 60, 70, 80 years, I lived a lie. 
That's not easy to say. For 50, 60, 70 years, I threw my life away believing in something that was worthless, that was vile, that at the end of the day is absolutely disgusting. You know who had the same by Yismama? You know who? Many Jews in Germany and Vienna in the 1930s. As a German Jew once told me, his father didn't make it, he survived. He says, you don't understand. He was singing to me German, a secular German Jew, he was singing German poetry. Better than Germans. Germans were great poets, great scientists, great musicians, very talented people, very cultured people. They weren't barbarians in that sense. In terms of culture, they were brilliant. And uh, he told me that he was the valedictorian. And the valedictorian, the, day, the night before, his mother got a call and said that uh, the Gestapo said, no way, a Jew could not be the valedictorian. I think 1935 or 36 was just the beginning. And he says, but I would not believe that this was Germany. I blamed it on a few crazy people. And he starts singing. I met him in a shul once on Pesach in Connecticut by my sister. And he starts singing to me, Goethe and Schiller, their poems. He's singing. And he's still a German at heart. Then they, they, they burnt his, his father in a concentration camp. They brought him to ashes. This is before the, before the world began. And he lived the whole war in Germany as a... Fa he looked a little bit blonde, so he lived as an Aryan, as a German, with his mother. So he was a Jew who lived in Berlin throughout the war, and he survived. Until today, he knows what the Germans did. But emotionally, he's still in love with the culture of the country. It was hard for Jews to believe. Jews were more German than Germans. The levels of assimilation in Germany and Vienna were extraordinary. In the mid-1800s, around 40% of Berlin Jewry converted to Christianity by volition because they wanted to be integrated, and they became integrated. The levels of intermarriage, their integration in all the fields. The first and last foreign minister of Germany was a Jew. He was murdered in 1922. Rottenhau, Rottenhau, the Secretary of State of Germany after the First World War was a Jew. The scientists, including an Einstein and a Freud, okay, they both left. The musicians, including a, a Felix Mendelssohn, you're dealing with in terms of science and art and music and politics and law and financial success. German jury was on top of the game. And then came the 1930s. And they started to, to hear this venom and they couldn't believe it. They said Hitler's a Meshuggah and he's having a bad day. You got to send him to therapy. They couldn't believe it. They read Mein Kampf. He's exaggerating a nut job. Very many couldn't believe it. Lloyd was forced to get out. Some of them, nobody held their hand to go out. In the late 1950s, Leon Festinger coined the phrase, cognitive dissonance. You ever heard of cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance means cognitive dissonance. It's painful to live with dissonance when you have two truths that conflict and they pull you in different directions. It's unbearable, it's too much, so what do you do? You deny one of them, or at least you reduce the truth of one of them, because you can't live in contradiction, you can't live in paradox. That's the vayisma mo. He can't just go on. He can't just say it was all one big sheker. It was one big deceptive lie. It's not who I am. It's so, it's so painful to do that. To look at the mirror that way. And therefore you're still hoping that no, no, no. Maybe the last minute. <laughs> this will change. Maybe it's not so bad. Maybe I don't have to leave. Now do you understand why Lloyd's wife turned around? <laughs> Festinger has another phrase. It's called post-decision dissonance. You know what post-decision dissonance means? Even after you make a decision, you can't be at peace. It's too difficult. So what do you do? You keep on looking back. It's not physically, it's emotionally. You keep on looking back. You keep on looking back. The Malach said, don't look back. That is evil. That is destruction for you. Don't look back. It's not a beautiful life. It's a horrible life. Don't look back. 
You lived it, learn from it, but don't look back. Don't go back, because if you look back, you go back. When you look back, you go back. You end up in the abyss, because that's what the devil does. That's called post-decision dissonance. Because the harder the decision, the more the de- you delay it. And the more you delay it, the more you keep on looking back. That's the story of Ayis Mama. So the Malachim have to grab him and his wife and his two daughters and say, out! Because he can't get himself to do it. He's stuck in this extraordinary quandary, in this extraordinary dilemma. And that's why you'll see a very fascinating thing. And that is, after each Shalshalas, you have, you can look at any Chumash, after each Shalshalas, a Shalshalas is always the first word of a Pasuk. Do you realize that? By Yismama, by Yoimar, by Yishchot, by Yemoin, always the first word of a Pasuk. And after the Shalshalas, you'll always be a Psik. A Psik. A line which we would call an exclamation point. Why? It's almost like God is saying, you're stuck. It's time to make a Psik, a Psak. Make a decision. Don't get out of your shalshelas. After every shalshelas, there'll be a psik. Why? That's the, that's the counterpart. That's the counterbalance. You're stuck in, but your mama make a psik. Now, now, dear friends, contrast this with Lloyd's uncle. The old-fashioned, isolated, segregated Jew of Rome who Lloyd spent his life running away from emotionally and physically. Look at him. Avram never told the people around him, I'm just like you. Never. He never invested his life on being like other people. In fact, he even needs a burial plot for his wife, and he's pleading. How does he introduce himself? Geir v'soyshav anoichi imach. I'm a citizen, but I'm a geir. I'm an outsider. Look at me. I'm an outsider. I'm a toy shop. I pay taxes. <laughs> Dina de Malchusa Dina. I'm a good citizen. I'm loyal. But you should know I'm a gear. I'm an alien. <laughs> I don't live like you. The exact opposite. Light becomes a judge. And they tell him you're a gear. Avram says, I'm a gear. You would look at, you would think they would look at him and they would say, get out. Avram works with them. He fights a war. He fights a war for the five kings, including the king of Zdoim. He's a great Samaritan and he feeds three Arab Bedouins and extends himself. He's not a tribal, parochial isolationist who lives in a cocoon and can't look at the world. Vayikra Shem B'Shem Hashem Keloilam Avram is a revolutionary and he's ready to transform the world. But he never surrenders his identity. On the contrary, he's going to transform, not be transformed. He knows who he is. And the Bnei Ches, look at Avram Avinu, and they say to him, You're a prince of God. You're a royal divine aristocrat. That's Loit versus Avram. Lloyd strives his whole life to get rid of his identity, to integrate. And in a moment of truth, they say, Arois, don't dare tell us how to run our country. We will hurt you even more. Avram Avinu is always true to his core, to himself. And all they have to say to him is, Nesi Eloikim, Ata Besecheinu. You're a prince of God in our midst. And if you look at history, you will see it's an equation that has not changed. Non-Jews respect Jews who deeply respect Judaism. And not only they respect it in their own little hole, in their own little shtibel, in their own little shalashudas, in their own little shir. They respect Judaism. As Rabbi Yonis and Ipshit says in the Megillah, Ish Yehudi Hoya B'Shushan Habiru Shmai Mardechai. There was only one Jew in Shushan Abira. There were many Jews in Shushan Abira. So Bionis Sinaipshit says, no, no, no. There were many Jews in Shushan Abira, but they were all in the Shtiblach. Or they were eating by a Cheshvedish Shmogas board. One of the two extremes. Ish Yehudi Hoya B'Shushan Abira. There was one man who was a Jew in Shushan Abira. He was a Jew. He wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't ashamed. 
His, he was made up of deep spiritual confidence. Peshush and Abiri was a Jew. Everyone else said, bow, you have to bow, you have to bow, you've got to integrate. Achashverosh is inviting you to a meal, you're going to get pictures with the White House. Finally, the New York Times will feature you on the first page, the Shushan Times. And they told Malchus, but at the end, because non-Jews are embarrassed by Jews who are embarrassed by Judaism. Never be ambivalent about who you are and about what you are. But here, it finally goes one step deeper and we'll see here a little bit of the Nefloyus, the stupendous wonders of Torah. Rav says a person is obligated to become intoxicated on Purim. You remember this Gemara? Until you don't know the difference between Haman is cursed and Mardachai is blessed. Okay. Till Rav, nobody believed you have to get drunk on Purim. Rav lived hundreds of years. Rav was born in the year 299 after the Common Era. That's 200, more than 200 years after the Churban Beis Hamikdash. Churban Beis Hamikdash happened hundreds of years after Purim. So Rava lived more than a half a millennium after Purim. Six, seven hundred years. Nobody ever said you have to get drunk on Purim. Rava was the first one. Next, Brach Islam and Hey. Rava, there's a race missing here. Rava have a shasi chamra kol ma'ila yayim the pischa. You know what Rava used to do a whole era of Pesach? What do you do a whole era of Pesach? Everybody is stressed out, right? Erev Pesach, unless you're in a hotel, then you're even more stressed. But people are stressed out, Erev Pesach. In a hotel you're stressed out because you don't know what to do. And at home you're stressed out because it's Pesach. And Erev Pesach, people are stressed. One of my uh, not such bad habits is I like to play the piano sometime. So my parents, my parents' home, they have a beautiful piano. What are those pianos called? Those, uh, huh? Yeah, one of the baby grands, a very beautiful piano. They always had on the upstairs. So it was Erev Pesach, uh, I don't know, like 10 minutes before Lichtzinder. So I had engechapt a taiva to play the piano. So I sat down by the piano and I started to play music. So I have a shachin, I was living in Karnas, I have my neighbor. He goes out to the porch, he says, Why, why, bismish sugar? It's 10 years before 10 minutes. I don't have matzah, I don't have mud, I don't have chadoises, I don't have wine, I don't have a seid, I don't have anything. Where do you have the chutzpah? The windows were open, the spilsich piano. Where did you get this chutzpah from? Come help me, make a seder. I have to grind modern, I have to check the salt. You remember, you have to squeeze the orange juice. So out of Pesach, it's an avoid. This is pre-hotel days. And some holy Jews do all these things. And a regular, a lot of Jews. So I told him, listen, my tired of I'm afraid that people like you are going to forget that the essence of Pesach is liberty, freedom, emancipation. You get so caught up and everything you have to do, you don't sit back, smell the air, and say, what does it mean to be a free person? You're not gonna, you're gonna forget how to fly, how to dance, how to soar. So that's why I'm the guy who sits down right before Lichtsen by the piano, as though there's no issues going on, just to remind you that this is a time of freedom and liberty. And to his credit, he said, you know, you're so right. Now let me go buy, let me go make haroises and murder and, and whatever he had to make. So look what Rava used to do. Where did I get this from? Rava. The Gemara says, Rava, a whole Erev Pesach he used to drink. <laughs> you, who's, who's drinking all Erev Pesach? Me loif, me kump, me geit, me shreit. Everyone is stressed out. Erev Rosh Hashanah, Erev Yim Kippah, Erev Pesach, and Erev Rav. It's a mitzvah to be frustrated, annoyed, stressed out, and not relaxed. Why? Nobody knows. There's nothing to do. What are people doing out of Yom Kippur? What do you have to do out of Yom Kippur? But it's an internal anxiety. Okay? Out of Rosh Hashanah, it's very deep anxiety. Now, some anxiety, Eima Sadin, is a good thing. But when anxiety turns you into a uh, frustrated, annoyed person, you can't serve God. Ivduas Hashem B'Simch is even out of Yom Kippur, even out of Rosh Hashanah. So Ravi used to drink out of Pesach. Why? Because Rav said, you drink, you'll ask the doctors, they'll tell you, the heart opens up, and the matzah is much more gishmak. You can eat more matzah, and it's gishmak. So we see here two stories about Rav, and they both have to do with drinking. 
Purim, he says, everybody should drink. And out of Pesach, where there's no mitzvah to drink, <laughs> Rav is also. This is a real toyamel. How do you explain this? How do you explain this? So Rabbi Avram Chizkuni writes, they explain it from an Arizal. The Arizal in Lekut Torah, he has a say for Lekut Torah, asks, it says in Lech Lecha, the kings, Kedar Laimer and his colleagues, went and they destroyed the king of Zdoim and his empire. And who did they kidnap? They kidnapped Loit, the Esrechushoi, his property, the son of the brother of Avram, and they left and he was in Zdoim. You see something strange in this Pasuk? What's very strange in this Pasuk? really doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> it had to say, Vayikhu as Loit, Ben Achi Avram, Vesrechushai. You don't say you took Loit and you took his property, which was the son of Avram. Your property is not related to Avram. Vayikhu as Loit, they took Loit, Ben Achi Avram. Loit is the nephew of Avram, Vesrechushai. Right? Or say, Vayikhu as Rechush Loit, Ves Loit. So that Rizal says that here, Moshe Rabbeinu intimated something deeper. Rechushoi ben Achi is the acronym of the name Rava. Reish Vez Aleph. Rechushoi Achi ben Achi. You see, they took Loit. But Loit also was holding on to a Rechush. <laughs> he was holding on to a property. And that property was the soul of Rava. Rava was considered one of the greatest Talmudic sages in history. Lived in the 4th century after the common era, the Rosh Hashiva of Mechuzah. In Bavel, the colleague of Abaya, when the Gemara wants to describe Torah Shabal Ped, it calls it Havayas, the Abaya Virava, the learning of Abaya and Rava, those two, because Abaya and Rava are the two colleagues who dispute and argue and talk throughout the whole Shas. You know how many arguments there are between Abaya and Rava and Shas, anybody? 428. 428 arguments constantly. Anybody wants to list them? <laughs> 428 arguments in Abayin You're already Googling to see if Rabbi YY made a mistake, yeah? So Google it and let me know. Let me know if I'm off. I also Googled it, don't worry. <laughs> it's fine. It'll be Eidem HaMakchishim Zezel. Apesha Os, Apesha Hit. Rabbi and Rav have 428 arguments. They represent Tayyash Abba. Rav Loit was carrying up Rav's soul. Rav's soul comes from Lloyd's seed, from, Lloyd, from, his, from Namaha Minus, from Amin, which comes from Lloyd's daughters. That's Rav's soul. Rav is the core of Torah Shabal Peh. So the Megala Mukha says, before Jews got Torah Shabiksav by Matan Torah, they had to go to Mitzrayim. Before, they had to go to Mitzrayim. But who does everything? Avram, Maisa of a similar bonum. So first he had to go down to Mitzrayim. Where did Jews get Torah Shabal Peh? They got Torah Shabal Peh in Bavel. They got Torah in Babylonia, and therefore Avram had to fight a war with all these Malachim. Some of them were from Bavel near Bavel, and that's where he got the soul of Rava. The soul of Rava, which is the source of Torah Shabal Peh, was embedded in Loit. When Loit was being kidnapped, it wasn't Loit would be lost. Loit would be lost, but also Rava's soul would be lost. Now the connection between Rava and Loit is a profound one and a complicated one Kabbalistically. It's not for today, but that's what Arizal says, Ruchushe ben Achi Avram. And he even continues, and he says, he also says, the next psukim, it says, in Lech Lecha, when Avram Avinu liberates Loit, and he liberates all the people of Zdoim, and the king of Zdoim tells him, Ten li anefesh, v'aruchush kachloch, take the soul, give me the souls, and take all the money, and Avram Avinu says, I'm not taking your money. But Avram Avinu does say one thing, Bil odai rak asher achlu hana'arim. One thing I'm going to take. I'm going to take that, which my youth, my youth, uh, my youth consumed, that's what I'm going to take. So the Arizal says, Bilodai, Rak Asher, I'm only going to take is also Beis, Resh, Aleph, is also Rava. And Avram also has the three letters, Aleph, Beis, Resh, is also Rava. If that's the case, Avram Chizkuni writes, what happened with Loit at the end? Loit became a drunk. <laughs> Loit, who ultimately was such a conflicted soul, what do people do after they experience such profound conflict? You know what people do? What do people do with cognitive dissonance? Unless you're ready to face your demons and face what's going on, sometimes you go to the bottle, right? That's what Noyach did after the flood. And that's what Lloyd's daughters decide to do. 
Venashke Savinu Yayin, Loit becomes an inebriated person and the rest is history. Ravas, whose neshama comes from Loit, deals with drinking in Gemara. Ravas' objective is to fix, to repair the intoxication of Loit, and therefore Rava focuses on the wine of Purim, which is Adela Yada, which is, could bring to a similar situation like Loit, when people are so smashed or drunk, you never know what they can do. The Gemara continues over there the story, Kam Rabbe, Shachta Lirabzeda, which we explained in the Shir right before Purim. What Pshad that Rabbi slaughtered the Bzeda. Rabbi was Rav's teacher, one of Rav's teachers, and he slaughtered the Bzeda by Sudas Purim. Okay, we explained what that meant at length. So Rav fixes up Lloyd by going back into that space and fixing the wine. Erev Pesach, to be able to open it up for matzah, and Purim, to be able to experience an Adalayad. In other words, Rav takes the energy of Lloyd and sublimates it since it's, his soul comes from Rav. Now, Rav has an interesting statement in Gemara that's very difficult. But in light of the shir, I think it will become clear. So the Gemara in Saita, hey, Amar Ebchiyah Barashi Amar Rav, Talmud Chachem Tzadik Sheyehi Bay Echad Meshmai Nebrishminus. A Talmud Chachem has to have an eighth of an eighth of uh, what people say, gaiva, arrogance. I would call confidence. In other words, a Talmud Chachem, somebody who's a student of Torah, needs to have a certain sense of self value. Not too much. He says an eighth of an eighth. An eighth of an eighth is. How much is an eighth of an eighth? Samach Gimel, right? 63rd part. I'm sorry, Samach Dalet, the 64th part. The Marsha says, because if he'll have one more, he'll become a gas. Samach Gimel. He'll become a gas. He'll become a brute, arrogant person. But you have to have a certain dosage of internal confidence to know who you are. Amr Rebhuna Baredu Rebbe Yeshua Umaatru Leiki Sasele You have to decorate your identity like a crown of a stalk. A stalk of grain, on top of it is like a crown. It's a shell. That's what the arrogance has to be like. You have to understand what the marshal is. Omar Rav. Rav said, Beshamta de Izbe or Beshamta de Lesbe? Shamta means a cherem, excommunication. A Talmud Chachem who has arrogance should be excommunicated. A Talmud Chachem who doesn't have arrogance should be excommunicated. That's great. So what is Rav telling us? If you have, right, so you can't live with him, you can't live without him. Rav says, you can't live with it. If you're with it, you're out. I'm not going to listen to you. But if you don't have it, you're also out. So what's the position of Rav? Basham to the Izbe or Basham to the Lesbe? What is Rav trying to tell me? <laughs> Should a Talmud Chacham say, okay, I'm a piece of dust. I'm a nobody. Step on me. Then he says, Shamta, you're out. And if not, wait to Shamta. What is Rav telling us here? Rav is helping us repair the mistake of Loit. The Vayismama of Loit. Rav is saying it's in this paradox that the Talmud Chachem thrives. It's in this, in this vacillation that the person excels. Rav Simcha Binim said you have to have two pieces of paper in the two pockets. In one pocket you have to have a piece of paper that says Chayev Adam Loima Bishvili Nivra Ha'olam The world was created for me. In another piece of paper, you have to have a paper that says, So which one is it? On one level, a person ought never to take themselves seriously, never to take their ego seriously, never to uh, disagree and become disagreeable, <laughs> never to make things personal and to allow your egotistical shell to take over your life, but rather... Humility is the key feature that allows a person to be real, divine, and grow. That's why Rav says a Talmud Chacham who, does, who, has, who has arrogance is Beshamta. He's not a Talmud Chacham. On the other hand, that the danger of that is that the person completely loses their identity. They don't know who they are anymore. And they don't appreciate their life. They don't value their decisions. They don't realize the indispensability of their days and the significance of their resources. There's something in you that the whole world is waiting for. And if therefore you don't live up to who you are, something will forever be lost in history. Nobody before you and nobody after you will ever be able to fulfill that. Bishvili. How can I say Bishvili Nivraelam and you also? We're both Meshuga. We're both, neat, we're both crazy. You say the whole world was for me. I say the whole world was for me. I mean, how do you do that? How do you say? A Yid once told me he went to a shul to speak. He was speaking in a shul. So he said over a letter from the Baal Shem Tev, a letter from the Baal Shem Tev to Reb Gershon Kittever, 
that he had Aliyah Sana Shama Rosh Hashanah Tov Zion, 1846. I'm sorry, 1746. And the Baal Tov says, it's a printed letter in Ben Peris Yosef. He went to the, when he had a, his neshama went up and he went to the Hekel of Mashiach. And he asked Mashiach, when are you going to come? So Mashiach quoted the Pasuk in Mishlech, when your wellsprings will be spread out everywhere to the furthest corners of the universe, including Mansi. Then I could come. So this Yid in Shul, in, in Brooklyn, chazed over this, uh, this, uh, this, 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 Vartan this, So there was a yid sitting in the back of the shul, and he said, Echidenknesht. I don't remember. So he said, it's printed in Ben Peres Yosef in the back, a letter. He says, Echidenknesht, I don't remember. So he said, it's printed here, you could look it up here. Echidenknesht. So finally, the Rav told him, you don't understand, this Jew decided he's Mashiach. So he says, Echidenknesht, I don't remember that I ever had such a conversation with the Baal Shem Tov. That's what he meant. The speaker thought he doesn't remember where it's printed. He says, I don't remember. I never had such a conversation. Okay? So I, I, I say, you say, and he says, you say, is the pshat that the person ought to understand that there's something in my life and the entire, that is so significant that all of history is at stake for that. And in that sense, the world was created for me, for nobody else. There's something else the world was created for you, and every person the same thing. Chayav Adam Leimer. But then Anoy Chiyaf of Eifer. The tragedy of light was, the tragedy of light was, he couldn't master that balance that Avram Avinu had. That true humility creates true pride. And true pride creates true humility. Avram Avinu always knew who he was. He was never embarrassed of who he was. And therefore he says, Gave And therefore they told him to see the Kimata Basekhainu. I'll never forget, and I'll conclude with this. I was once invited to speak uh, by the Pentagon. I was invited to speak to the chief of chaplains of the US Army. It's a whole long story. I once shared part of it, but I just want to tell you one line. So I spoke there. And then I was invited, I was invited a few times afterwards. It was in, uh, in uh, South Carolina. In South Carolina. Um, they have a retreat for the chaplains of the U.S. Army, mostly non-Jews, hundreds and hundreds of people, or thousands of people, at least a thousand people or more. And uh, I don't know, there were maybe 11 Jews there. Most of them were chaplains of the U.S. Army, so they served the U.S. Army, which mostly non-Jews. For some reason, most Jews don't go into the U.S. Army. They like real estate better. But uh, so there's not many Jews. There were a few Muslims. There was a, uh, maybe a Hindu, a Buddhist, a few, and, uh, and, and a few Jews, including my friend Colonel Goldstein, Jake Goldstein, who was the Shatchim, and uh, the only chaplain with, with Metabard in the U.S. Army, got a special hetter, and, uh, and then the rest was, uh, was Episcopalian, and then, of course, Catholic, and Protestant, and Baptist, and so forth. So how I got the job is, is again, Samais, it's a whole parsha of a fascinating story, but it's not for now, it's a long story. So I spoke there, the chief of chaplains at the time was a man named Douglas L. Carver, nice yeshiva shenay. And uh, Douglas L. Carver is a Baptist, a Baptist by training, and he rose to the top to become the chief of chaplains of the entire U.S. Army. That includes the military, the Navy, and the Air, Air Force. And uh, he introduced me. Uh, and he spoke after me. So I spoke. I spoke for an hour, whatever I spoke. And uh, I have to tell you, speak, I speak a lot to Jews. And I also have spoken often to non-Jews. Speaking to non-Jews is a very different experience than speaking to Jews, because non-Jews actually listen. <laughs> For Jews, it's very hard to listen to a speech. Most Jews, they have opinions. They don't listen. They form opinions as you're talking. You'll see this. I know from, I know from a lot of experience. It's very hard for Jews to actually listen to what the person is saying. Every Jew is sitting and saying, oh, that's a good one. You're not listening. This I'm going to use next Shabbos. Every Jew. This, this I'm going to use. This I'm going to say over. Ah, this one I heard already. Ah, this sheet he said three years ago. Why did I have to waste my time Sunday morning to come? I heard it already. Right? And if you tell a joke, he whispers the end of the joke. That's how it is. Goyim don't have that Yetzirah. They have different Yetzirahs. They also shut off their cell phones. Jews don't do that. Because every Jew thinks Trump is going to call them soon. <laughs> to find out how to run the country. Goyim don't have that issue. It's a different, it's a different Muslim. Also, most Jews, they sit like this. For the first half of the shir, they sit like this. And this always means, don't get close to me. That's to say, maybe in the middle, maybe in the middle, if you melt them, they take off. You could take it off already. 
can't stop shading. It's already the end of the shear, don't worry. But it's a psychological thing. You ever saw Jews like this? Like, don't get close. Like, we try to create an emotional, an emotional distance. Non-Jews actually want to be moved. They actually want to be. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole different, it's a whole different model. Among Jews themselves, religious Jews are much harder to speak to, because first of all, who are you to tell me? That's number one. Second of all, I know everything. Third of all, why do they come? They come for me. Third of all, Bishvili Nivra I just told you. And Anoichi Afaveifa. Third of all, and this is maybe the deepest thing, from Jews grew up hearing speeches. And usually they're coming out of their ears. There's nothing they didn't hear. They heard that they're Rishoyim, Shkotzim, horrible, the Ganat. They heard everything about them, how bad they are. They heard it, and they hear it nonstop. We grew up in a culture of speeches, of sermons, of drushes, of toides, of shalashudas, of musr, and so forth. So by definition, we're already sick of it. So we sit down, you're guilty till proven innocent. By Jews, you're guilty till proven innocent. By nature, there's nothing to hear. And Lahav del Goyim have their things, but in this Indian, it's a Gewaldic Indian to speak to them. Nobody sits like this. They sit like this. And they give feedback in the middle of talking, which Jews don't know how to do. Jews, at best, at the end, they say, Shekoyach. And even that, they don't spell out, because they don't want to be vulnerable. It's very hard to say to a Jew, thank you, that was meaningful. You don't say these words. You say, Shekoyach. Shekoyach. Sometimes you'll say, not bad. But uh, non-Jews, in the middle of the speech, I'm like finishing a sentence, and they're like, yes, Rabbi! <laughs> Amen! Hallelujah! Now imagine you start doing that. Imagine in the middle, and you say, yes! Go, 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 go! That's what they were doing. You have a thousand people sitting. And like, yeah, awesome. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless them. God bless them. God bless them. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? So they're actually experiencing something. In their own way, they're experiencing something. There's also one more thing about this. I hate to say this. They know the Bible. <laughs> so when you say apostate, they finish it. With Jews, you never have that happen. <laughs> they finish learning daf yoimi. How would they? They don't have time for the Bible. Jews, that doesn't happen. They don't finish Pesukim. They finish. I'm like, Genesis 40, and they do it, you know? 43, yeah, and Joseph said, okay. Anyway, I finished the, I finished the speech, and I do my thing, and Douglas L. Uh, Carver gets up. And he says, so you have to understand now, different Christian preachers speak different ways. The Baptists is the beginning of Kolatz Moisei. They holler, they scream, they, 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 they let their souls go out. Nafshi Yatsa Badabra. Douglas Carver is a Baptist by training. Now he's the, he was the head of the whole U.S. Army chaplaincy. But, so he gets up and he says, you know, he thanked me and he gave chazorah of what I said. He gave a five-minute chazorah of the whole shir, which was interesting, that you'll also want to have a Jew doing. So they should all remember it. And then he says, I just want to say, you know, I was listening to Rabbi Jacobson speak. And the way he speaks, and the passion he displays when he speaks, it's obvious to me that he spent time by the Baptists. <laughs> it's obvious. He learned by us, he was trained by us. It's obvious. Okay. So everybody like you starts giggling, everybody starts giggling. It was funny. I'm standing there, I look more or less like I look here with a yarmulke, with a payas, I was wearing a suit with a tie. And... Uh, I had my tzitzis, you know, hanging out, but I was tucked in, like now. And uh, he's ready to move on. So now I had my Vayisma Mo moment. I'm not going to say it was as dramatic. It also lasted for a second or a millisecond. But I had a dilemma. What was my dilemma? You know what my dilemma was. He was joking. I don't think he thought that I grew up by the Baptists. I certainly didn't look it. But, on the other hand, Baptists is a sect of Christianity. Christianity is Avoid Zarah. Maybe not for a non-Jew, right? According to the Ramah that Bnei Noyach are not mitzvah on Shittuf, they're allowed to, it's fine, it works. But for a Jew, certainly, it doesn't work. Even as a joke, I felt it was uh, something that I had to uh, uh, respond to. On the other hand, it wasn't batamt. <laughs> I just got tremendous honor from them. Um, uh, he, was, he was extolling virtues. I mean, I'm not going to tell them all to you. You could ask my mother. Uh, 
or my schwiger even. And, uh, and he's the chief of chaplains of the US Army. I don't know, two, three, four star general. I don't know, but a lot of stars. And in the army, it's not like by us, you say whatever you want to anybody. You say something wrong, it's 600 push-ups. Yeah? When, in the morning, everybody's like this. You know, you walk over there, everybody's azoy, azoy, azoy. And Dr. Gold, Colonel Goldson says, Jacobs, and don't salute because you don't know how to do it. And if you salute the wrong way, it's like 250 push-ups, 350 push-ups. <laughs> now, uh, I wasn't about to do 600 push-ups over there by interrupting Douglas Carver. On the other hand, I'm saying, he, he's joking anyway. The guy's joking. Be, 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 have a little humor. Then I thought to myself, this is all in my mind, of course. I thought to myself, one second. We all know, I know the truths of Jewish history very well. The only reason I'm here today, in the 21st century, speaking in South Carolina, to uh, thousands or hundreds of, of, of Christian chaplains, is only because I had grandparents, grandmothers, grandfathers, great-great-grandmothers and grandfathers, who literally sacrificed their life to remain Jewish. Every Jew alive today, somewhere in the link, there's somebody who literally put their life in jeopardy to remain Jewish whether it was 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50, 70 years ago, or, uh, or 900 years ago. That's the only reason we're here, because we weren't supposed to be here. And they did this not in the comfort of a hotel in South Carolina. They did this under duress and sometimes under the danger of dying like so many did. Whether it was during the Crusades or so many of them, they had the ability to convert to Christianity and they refused and died. And some escaped and some survived. So they were ready to sacrifice their life to say that they will not kiss the cross, that they will not deny Hashem Echad. And here in free America, I'm going to stand up and he makes a joke that I, I, I was at the Baptist and I'm not going to say anything in freedom because it's going to be disrespectful. I felt it was a betrayal of my, uh, my ancestry, a betrayal of my people, a betrayal of my history. And then there's another voice in me and says... Stop with this Jewish obsessive guilt. Meshugana that you are. You gave a beautiful speech. You made a Kiddush Hashem. Everybody's applauding you. The guy made a stupid joke. It was funny. Move on, you idiot. Come on. I was like, this Jewish obsession. You're learning Gemara too much. So, not a Maram Shif. The guy made a joke. Let, let's, let's stop with you, Pilpula. And I'm going back and forth, back and forth. What am I supposed to do? There's no simon in Shulchan Aruch about this. There's no clear psak din. Oh my God, it's a, moment, you know, it's a moment in your heart. You have to make a decision. Then I think to myself, you know, they didn't invite me because of my looks. Maybe, but I don't think so. They didn't invite me because of my brains. I don't think so. They didn't invite me because my name is Yosef Yitzchak Jacobson. They invited me as a representative of the Jewish people. So it's not really about me. They didn't invite me as an individual who lives in New York and they wanted, they wanted to see my face. They invited me as somebody to speak on behalf of the Jewish people, which they represented me. So it's really not about me. It's about the Jewish people. And I have a duty to the Jewish people. <laughs> so it was not difficult for me. It was, I'm sorry. It was, not, it was very difficult for me. And after this dilemma, I decided I'm interrupting him. And I interrupted him. He was in the middle of talking. And I interrupted him, which you don't do. <laughs> You don't interrupt. Again, it's not like by us where you dafka interrupt. You don't, not, people don't know what it means not to interrupt, right? You're having a conversation with somebody. Somebody walks in and says, by the way, excuse me doesn't exist. It's pasnash. But over there, you don't interrupt, especially not Carver. I interrupted him. And I said, excuse me. I have to correct something. You said that I spent time by the Baptists. That's where I got my passion from. So let me just say it on the record. The Baptists learned it all from us. That's what happened. The Baptists learned it from the Jews. You know what happened? They all started to applaud. They gave me a thundering applause, like you did. Not all of you, but some of you. Those who are less restricted. And they went on. And Carver also applauded me. He's standing there, he went like this, and then he continued. I thought to myself, isn't that strange? When he said, I learned by the Baptists, nobody applauded. They giggled. They found it funny. When I said, no, you learned it from me, you learned it from us, 
they started to applaud me. Why? It should have been the other way around, if anything. And then I realized, as I was looking in their eyes, this profound and historic truth in a very deep emotional way that many Jews don't realize. It made them feel better about themselves when I claimed and maintained my distinctive Jewish identity and the role of the Jewish people in the history of civilization. Somehow, it made them more comfortable in their own skin. It made them feel that they're living in a safer world, in a better world, in a more clear, decisive, and spiritually clear world, a world of clarity, when the Jew knew who he was and who he was not. When he said, I came and I learned it from the Baptist, it was funny, it was cute, no question. When I said, you learned it from us, we stood at Mount Sinai, and we, were the we are the ambassadors of God in this world, it made them feel better, not only about me, but also about themselves. It made them feel more comfortable in their own skin. Why? Because they know truth. They sense truth. People sense truth. And the truth is that the Jew was chosen to be the moral teacher of the world. The light onto the nations. Even though most Jews today were still uncomfortable with this. Especially religious Jews who should be the most comfortable with this are the least comfortable with it. And we're not going to analyze now the reasons for it, but we have spent 2,000 years in exile and we learned to be embarrassed. And we also were not in a very nice world, let's face it. I mean, it's not just our issue, right? We lived through tremendous hostility, never mind the last century what Jews went through. So we tend, especially, to, to, to run, to curse, to curse the world. But the vision of humanity, the vision of Avraham Avinu was not to curse the world. The vision of Avraham Avinu was to change the world, to transform the world. We say it three times in Aleinu. That's the vision of the Gula, that's the vision of Yiddishkeit. The Rambam says in Hilchis Malachim Zion that Amaimed Har Sinai, Moshe gave every Jew a commandment to be responsible that every non-Jew observes the Sheva Mitzvah's Bnei Noyach. This is a Psaq in the Rambam, Halachil Moshe Misinai. Could have we done it most of our history? No. We were busy trying to survive. Go to a non-Jew in Spain and tell him you have to observe the Sheva Mitzvah's Bnei Noyach. Merit Nishgefelt. Today we actually live in that time. Today the non-Jew would love to hear a message from the Jew. Today, most non-Jews would love to hear spiritual clarity from Jews. But for this, Jews can't stutter. For this, you have to have not arrogance, but deep spiritual confidence, which comes with humility. Who taught this? Rava. Beshamta de Izbe, but Beshamta de Lesbe. If you become arrogant, you're dangerous. But if you decide that you're worthless, you become equally dangerous. You become even more dangerous. And somehow I experienced then, at that moment, was... That, me standing up to the fact that I'm a Jew, and I'll never lie to you about that. And therefore, we are the ones who were chosen to teach the world about ethics, spirituality, truth, kindness, and goodness. They felt the truth in it. And it's like when a child feels that mommy is being mommy and tati is being tati, they're safer in their own house. When children feel that the teacher is being a teacher and not a baby, they feel, they feel safer in their own classroom. And when the world feels that Jews are being Jews, they feel deeper respect and admiration towards the Jewish people. If there will ever be a day that the world will love the Jewish people, it's when the Jewish people will love the Jewish people. If there will be a day that the world will finally accept Israel, it's when Israel will accept Israel, which we still have not reached yet. And if there will ever be a day that the world will truly look up to the Jewish people. It's when the Jewish people will internally truly embrace their destiny without a shalshalis. Have a wonderful week. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.